Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's COVID-19 legislative update for commercial real estate professionals. A recording of this presentation will be available on CCIM's YouTube channel at ccim.com slash COVID-19 later today. We're adding resources to that page regularly to help you weather the storm. It is now my pleasure to introduce Eddie Blanton, 2020 president for CCIM Institute. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this COVID-19 legislative update for commercial real estate professionals. I'm Eddie Blanton, 2020 president for CCIM Institute. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Aaron Stackley, senior representative for commercial legislative policy for the National Association of Realtors. Aaron's advocacy work in collaboration with the Institute is focused on supporting the commercial real estate industry. This work has never been more critical and we truly value the partnership with NAR as we fight for commercial real estate professionals. Today's presentation is part of CCIM Institute's larger effort to provide commercial real estate professionals with timely and useful resources, which you can find at ccim.com forward slash COVID-19. That's ccim.com forward slash COVID-19. Throughout the presentation, you can share questions for Aaron in the question and answer section of your toolbar. She'll address those questions at the end of her presentation. Thank you again for joining us. It's now my pleasure to welcome Aaron Stackley. Hi everyone. Thank you, Eddie, and thank you, CCIM. I am, um, I guess, as happy to be presenting to you right now as I can be under these circumstances. So I hope that you all get some good information from here. Um, I hope that some of this information provides you with a little bit of hope yourself. So let's dive right in. Um, let's see. Ah, there we go. Um, the technology of all this is still, um, I'm getting used to it. So I'm gonna start off with just saying we have a lot of resources in addition to those that Eddie just mentioned that CCIM is providing on our website, nar.realtor. Um, our general COVID-19 information page is www.nar.realtor forward slash coronavirus. Um, and here on your screen, you can see two of our sort of more holistic documents um, or links to the documents that we have on the information from the CARES Act itself. These are being updated regularly as we get more information. Um, some of these new programs, we're sort of getting uh, the rulemaking on it in spurts and stops and starts. So we're updating them as we get more information. And obviously, as Congress moves ahead with future relief efforts, we'll be updating with those as well. So I'm gonna start off with one of the um, very first things that NAR really dove into on the COVID-19 relief, which was getting real estate services listed as an essential service um, by the federal government. The federal government has something that I had never heard of before known as the Federal Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Um, and they provide a list of essential critical infrastructure workers as a guide to states and cities to use when they release emergency orders. Um, so NAR was successful in getting real estate, including, as you can see on your screen, residential and commercial real estate and settlement services listed as essential on that federal list. Now, governors still have the final say over what they have as listed as essential services within their states. So while the federal government has these guidelines, your state governor may determine that they want to narrow that list further. Um, so just so you all know, um, we're continuing to work with the state associations um, as well as CCIM, obviously, to try to get those governors, those states to have real estate listed as an essential service. And I do just wanna note, being considered essential does not make you ineligible for unemployment assistance. Um, you might be an essential service, but not be able to actually do your job because of everything else being shut down. So that does not disqualify you from unemployment. 
Um, I'm just going to really quickly go over this relief for individuals because um, I think most people are pretty well aware of it at this point, but the CARES Act did provide that individuals could get checks of $1,200 per adult plus $500 for each child um, who is a minor um, or under the age of 17. Um, you are also able to take up to $100,000 out of uh, retirement accounts without having to pay any early withdrawal penalty. Um, just to be super clear, the IRS is never going to call you and ask for your bank account information or your social security number. If someone calls you and asks for that, it is a scam. Do not provide that information to anyone over the phone. Um, in addition to those two little stimulus bits, um, the IRS has allowed people to wait until July 15th of this year to file their taxes. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see a link to the IRS page that has a lot more information for people um, who are interested in learning more about the specifics of that. Um, I'm going to really quickly talk about this homeowner and renter information. Um, I'm going to focus more on the um, multifamily aspect of this for you all. So, um, Homeowners with government-backed mortgages, so that's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, VA, and the USDA, Department of Agriculture, can request up to a 360-day payment forbearance without proof of hardship. Now, forbearance means that there's no additional fees, interest, or penalties assessed on it, but you must contact your servicer to be eligible, and then back payments will be due on the first day after the forbearance unless you've worked out some kind of repayment plan. Renters in a property with these loans can request relief from eviction for 120 days. So again, this doesn't relieve them from the responsibility to pay, um, but and so they have the option to work out some specific payment plan with their landlord or all past re due rent will be due immediately after the eviction relief ends. So if you get about four months um, eviction relief there, you would have to pay five months rent when that relief ends on the first of whatever month that is or however your rent is structured. Many landlords are also eligible for forbearance. Um, these are multifamily owners who have Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, or any loans that have been backed or assisted by any branch of the federal government. So if you've been, if your uh, mortgage has been touched by the federal government on a multifamily property, then you are eligible for forbearance. Um, that is for a total of 90 days. Um, each forbearance period is 30 days and you can request up to three of them. NAR has been um, working to try to get that 90 day relief to match up with the 120 day relief for eviction because obviously there's a little bit of a difference there and we don't wanna leave our landlords hanging. Um, we have been since the beginning advocating for proportionate relief for both tenants and property owners, keeping in mind that, you know, this is an ecosystem. And when one person is impacted, it's going to impact people both below and above them in the chain. So um, we know there was a lot of consternation about um, eviction moratoriums and not providing relief for the people that actually own the properties that those um, renters were in. And so we've been working to try to get some sort of resolution, some equitable relief for the landlords and property owners there. Um, it says home buying, selling information at the top, but this is really property buying and um, selling information. E-closings. Um, NAR has long time pushed for remote online notarization um, legislation that would basically give blanket of approval to the states to begin doing this. Some states do allow remote online notarization, um, and we actually have a bill that we've been pushing for in the House and Senate for a long time, which we are hoping will be included in the phase four COVID-19 relief. It's called the SECURE Act, and it basically says federally remote online notarization is allowed. Uh, this would allow people to do exactly what it says, remotely notarize documents without having to physically go anywhere, which obviously during a pandemic is crucial to being able to continue to do business. So that is um, one of the things that, again, we're hopeful to see in the upcoming phase four legislation. 
We also had some, um, and this wasn't in the CARES Act, but this was through um, executive action from the Treasury Department. We had tax deadlines that were extended through July 15th. So um, 1031 like kind exchanges. If someone uh, had taken the first step in starting a like kind exchange by selling an old property, then they've got the 45 day and the 100 day deadlines for that program. If they fall between April 1st and July 15th, that deadline is extended to July 15th. For opportunity zones, similar situation. If an investor sold a capital asset and they plan to put that gain into an opportunity fund, but they only have 180 days to do so, if that deadline falls between April 1st and July 15th, the investment can be made as late as July 15th. And finally, sole proprietors who pay quarterly estimated taxes have until July 15th to file their um, second quarter payment. Um, there has been a bit of confusion about exactly um, how this will work, especially with the 1031 deadlines being extended. NAR has um, joined with some other groups to request more information and more specificity from the IRS. Um, we understand that there are people that may have engaged in a 1031 that fell just before April 1st, and they were also impacted. I mean, I think technically um, some places started shutting down mid-February. So um, we are pushing to see that relief expanded and made a little more flexible. Um, so you don't have people who are sort of arbitrarily left out in the cold there. Okay. Let's get to um, the meat. This is what everybody sort of wants to hear about, and that's the pandemic unemployment benefits, the SBA economic injury disaster loans, or IDLE, as uh, apparently people are referring to it, and the SBA 7A payroll protection plan, or PPP loans. Before I get into this, these are three separate programs. Um, the pandemic unemployment assistance is administered by the DOL through the individual states. The SBA economic injury disaster loans are administered directly by the SBA, and the 7A payroll protection plan loans are administered by SBA lenders. Those are banks that participate in the program with the SBA. Um, as most of you probably know, the CARES Act appropriated about $360 billion for both of those SBA programs. And as of last Thursday, the SBA announced that the funding for both of them had run dry already due to the high demand. I'll be getting into a little bit more of the details of this um, in a moment, but we are confident, um, I'll say cautiously confident, if that isn't an oxymoron, that we will see an additional 300 and um, I think 10 billion appropriated for those programs within, well, we expect the Senate to approve it this evening, the House to take it up tomorrow, and we could see that signed into law probably as early as Thursday. So if you're wondering why I'm talking about programs that don't have any money right now, it's because they will have money again soon. So we want you all to have the information you need in order to be able to take advantage of them. Okay, um, I'm just going to really quickly talk about this uh, unemployment assistance program. Um, again, it's a Department of Labor program, but it is administered by the states. Um, we, there's been some bumps with this, I'll be honest. Um, the states are sort of looking for more guidance from the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor is having to act very quickly to try to put something together. Um, and it's, it's a situation where we're talking a bit about a round peg trying to go into a square hole um, because they've opened this program up to include independent contractors, which typically would not be eligible for unemployment benefits. So we're very excited about that, but it means that they have to retool, for example, all the application forms and to determine how you will assess um, how much unemployment an, un uh, an independent contractor can receive. So there's been a bit of administrative issues with this. Um, you can check and see if your state has already implemented it at the link that I have on the page here. And these slides will be available to everyone. Um, 
but there you can see where you can find out if your state has already begun implementing the program. Um, it provides benefits for those who are partially or fully unemployed due to COVID-19. Um, and that is up to 39 weeks of assistance through the end of this year. You can get an additional $600 per week on top of what your state unemployment benefits already are through the end of July this year. Um, real estate professionals, um, as I mentioned before, just because someone is listed as an essential service does not mean that they are going to be disqualified from this. Just because you can work doesn't mean that work exists at this time. Um, so I encourage you to um, check with your state labor agency. Um, most of them have updated their websites with information about how they are administering this program. And on to SBA. So I'm going to start with the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. This is actually a program that already existed within the SBA. They're available for small businesses if they suffered economic injury due to a disaster. So similar to um, a typical disaster loan, but for economic injury, not physical damage. Um, they can be used for a variety of purposes, including providing paid sick leave, um, maintaining payroll, meeting increased costs due to supply chain disruptions, rent or mortgage payments, and repaying debt obligations that were entered into before February 15th of this year. That's sort of what they're considering the start of the COVID-19 disaster. So what the CARES Act did was add a $10,000 advance grant to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which if it's used for an eligible purpose is um, uh, eligible for forgiveness. Um, what is an eligible purpose? Well, it's basically what I had already mentioned. Um, you can take this grant money and you can use it for payroll, uh, uh, the rent, mortgage payments, debt obligations, utilities, um, and uh, paid sick leave for employees. Um, now, due to the high demand for these grants within, uh, I'd say a couple of weeks of the CARES Act being passed into law, if you had already applied, you probably received this email. The SBA sent out a message to applicants that said that they were actually going to be prorating the advance grant amount based on employee numbers. So employees are able to get, or excuse me, employers are now able to get $1,000 per employee up to $10,000 in that advance grant money. Um, you know, we are not happy about this. Um, many real estate professionals are independent contractors, and this would mean that they are only eligible for a $1,000 advance, and of course the advance is the portion of this that is forgivable, um, and so we feel that puts them at a disadvantage. Um, the rationale behind it was simply that they wanted to be able to provide more money to more businesses across the board, um, or rather money in general to more businesses across the board. So. Um, uh, it's one of those things where um, we reached out to Congress when we asked them for more funding for these programs. We also asked them to provide more specific implementation rules um, because this is a bit of a departure from the text of the CARES Act that the SBA is taking. Having said that, um, with the demand continuing to stay at the same level as it was before, I'm not sure that we'll be successful in getting that changed. But Hopefully, um, people are still able to access these um, advances and use them, even if it is at that lower amount. Um, I'll also add, um, a, typically, an economic injury disaster loan would be have a limit of $2 million, the max amount. What we are hearing from people that are applying and what the SBA is sort of tiptoeing around is that they are now only allowing people who are applying for these as unsecured loans to get $15,000 in the EIDL loan itself with an additional possible $10,000 in that advance grant. So if you are applying for these as an unsecured loan, the max amount you could get is $25,000 and that is if you have 10 employees. So just keep that in mind. Um, Right now, this link doesn't work, but 
uh, whenever they get more funding, that application page will be back open um, for people to apply for. So um, the FBA actually created a streamlined application specifically for people applying due to COVID-19, um, and you can access it there. I myself have gone through the application a few times. Um, I stopped short of actually clicking, yes, I swear that all this is true, et cetera, et cetera, and submitting it. But um, it's, it's pretty easy um, to go through. Obviously, you'll need to determine how much you want to request in a loan. It, it's supposed to be based on working capital needs. Um, and the EIDL, the loan itself, not the advanced grant, does need to be paid back. Um, if you have applied um, and you did not receive your funds before the program ran out of appropriations, don't worry. The SBA is maintaining a queue of everyone who successfully applied. So basically, if you got that in before they took the application page down, then you should be in the queue to receive an EIDL loan. Um, we're not sure if the SBA has said they're continuing to process them on a first come first serve basis. I'm not sure if that means that they cut off the application before they ran out of funding for the program and they're just working through the applications they have now, or if they mean once they get more funding, they'll pick that back up. But what we know is, again, if you have applied for this program, then your application is there in the queue for these loans through the SBA. Um, you can see there, there's a customer service line. That is really more helpful if you are having trouble, I would say, filling out the application itself. They are not really able to um, check on the status of individual applications or help with too much specific information on these loans. I've called it, um, so I can vouch for that personally. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about the payroll protection plan loans. This has been getting a ton of press and a lot of attention. Um, we were very pleased that we were able to, once again, have um, independent contractors, sole proprietors included in those who are eligible to receive these loans. Um, as you can probably guess from the title of them, the payroll protection plan, the purpose of these is to keep uh, keep employers able to pay their employees, keep independent contractors able to receive an income for an eight week period. Um, so I'm going to talk about these in sort of two ways, because as we learned late last week, they are being treated slightly differently for um, two, two different types of um, employees. You one have small businesses with employees and two, you have independent contractors. Um, so these are uh, administered directly through the SBA lenders. Uh, if you already have an existing business relationship with an SBA lender and you're interested in applying for one of these loans, go there first. Um, you, we know that we have been hearing from members that they are having trouble finding SBA lenders who will take them because there is just such high demand for these that a lot of the banks are limiting it to existing customers. That is because um, there is a lot of administrative burdens that comes with bringing on new clients, and it is it just relieves a lot of that for banks to simply work with those they already have um, an existing relationship with, they've already done a lot of due diligence on. So if you already have an SBA lender that you have a relationship with, go there first. Having said that, if you don't, don't dismay. Um, you may have to try several lenders before you'll find one who will take you. We are hearing that people are having much better luck with um, their community and regional banks um, rather than the big national banks. Um, but you can find a list of SBA lenders at that link, or really if you just go to the SBA page or NAR's FAQ, we have links to that. Um, the CARES Act gave the administration the ability to increase the number of lenders uh, temporarily, specifically for this program. So we are seeing more lenders enter the pool, which um, hopefully will relieve some of that tension once they get more funding. So payroll protection plan, how does it work? These loans are based on um, either payroll or your income if you are an independent contractor for 2019. And I'll get to that in a moment, but they can be used to cover payroll costs, rent, 
mortgage interest and utilities. And if the FBA's requirements are met, these loans are forgivable. So let me start with talking about businesses with employees. If you're a small business with an employee, the way that you would calculate your loan amount is you would look at your payroll costs for the year prior and you would determine what your average monthly payroll cost was. You're then eligible to get 2.5 times that in a loan from an FBA lender through this program and you have eight weeks to use those funds. If 75% of those funds go toward maintaining payroll costs, and if you keep your employee numbers the same for that eight weeks as pre-COVID um, and use the remaining 25% of the loan for one of those eligible uses, again, payroll costs, rent, mortgage interest, utilities, then that loan is eligible for 100% forgiveness. Now, say you're not able to meet all those requirements. You have more pressing costs and you can't put a full 75% of it toward maintaining payroll or you've had to let an employee go and you simply can't afford to rehire someone right now. You're still eligible to have some of that loan forgiven. It just phases out as either of those levels drop below that required amount. Um, so that's for businesses with employees. Now, independent contractors, we learned mid last week, which was fun because it was a few days after they could actually apply for the program. So. Um, love that, uh, that the FCA was going to be treating them a little bit differently. Um, first of all, independent contractors should not be counted toward another small business's payroll protection plan um, loan when they're looking at their average monthly payroll costs because independent contractors can apply for their own. What independent contractors are eligible for is an amount equal to an eight week portion of their 2019 net earnings. Um, and that is used, they should have their IRS form 1040 Schedule C for 2019. The SBA has been very clear that you cannot use your 2018 1040 Schedule C. If you have not yet filed your 2019 taxes, you don't have to file them, but you do have to fill out that form for these loans. Um, so they'll be basing that um, net earnings on that 1040 Schedule C. You should also be prepared to provide your Form 1099 MISC. And um, again, an eight-week portion of those 2019 net earnings will be forgiven through the program for independent contractors. Um, the reason for the difference between these two is that the SBA determined that independent contractors are less likely to have the same overhead costs as a small business with employees. Um, you know, again, it's not ideal. Um, and I think we think that it overlooks um, the fact that many independent contractors do have overhead costs. Not everyone works out of their home or um, I think the SBA guidance said that many of them work out of their sheds, which obviously is not really gonna apply to real estate. Um, but um, that is what they determined. And again, it comes down to trying to get the funds to reach more applicants at this time. Um, so again, you know, we requested that Congress provide more specific implementation guidelines to the extent that they can on that. Um, at the bottom there, you can see the SBA page, which has um, resources on these and other loans for small businesses. Um, and um, you know, while we're in this sort of interim period where we're waiting for more appropriations to come for economic injury disaster loans and the PPP loans, um, you might check that out to see what other offerings you may be eligible for. So what is the number one question that I get about these? It's can I get both the economic injury disaster loan and the PPP loan? And the answer is yes, but there are caveats. Um, when you apply for these loans, you, uh, there's nothing that says you can't apply for both of them, nothing that says you can't receive funds from both of them, but they have to be used for separate purposes. So keep a careful accounting of how you're using the funds from each of these programs so you can show that you didn't intermingle them. In addition, if you get that advanced grant through the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program and you get the PPP loan and ultimately are eligible to have 
both of them forgiven. The EIDL advance grant amount is subtracted from the PPP forgiveness amount. So if you get $1,000 in an EIDL advance grant and you get $10,000 through the PPP loan program and you follow the rules and so you're technically eligible to have both of them forgiven, they will forgive that advance grant but then subtract it from the PPP loan. Basically, you can't double dip on forgiveness with these. Um, here we have a graph. I don't know how well you guys can see this, <laughs> but um, this is also available on NAR's website for um, SBA programs and CARES Act COVID-19 resources generally that sort of compares and contrasts the two programs here um, in terms of eligibility, how it can be used, the amounts that you can get, and the repayment terms. So I encourage you to check that out when you can probably see it a little bit better. Okay, so as I mentioned, funding ran out, what next? So again, if you already applied for an economic injury disaster loan and you actually did press submit on that application form on the SBA's page, then your loan application is in the queue within the SBA. You do not need to reapply. For the payroll protection program loans, because these are administered directly by individual SBA lenders, if you already applied but you had not yet been approved or had your funds dispersed, you should reach out to your lender to check on the status. Um, lenders are given a fair amount of leeway with how they're administering these programs. So um, some of them may hold the applications in a queue in you know, whatever order they got them in. Uh, some of them may require that you reapply when the funding comes through again. So reach out to your lender and check on it. Again, we do expect an additional $310 billion to be appropriated for these programs. Um, I would say we could see that signed into law as early as Thursday afternoon. Um, and uh, given the speed at which they burned through the original 360 billion, we know that that's not going to last through the remainder of this crisis. Um, from our conversations with leadership on uh, Capitol Hill, it sounds like they are prepared to continue to appropriate funds to these programs as necessary. We may be in a situation where the funding runs out, there is a gap for a few days to get more funding. That runs out, there's a gap for a few days. Um, unless Congress takes up some more dramatic measure or presents a new program that might replace this one. Um, if you haven't yet applied for either of these loan programs, you certainly can prepare to apply for as soon as those applications open up again. Um, for the EIDL loans, um, just uh, figure out how much money you would be applying for. Again, this is based on working capital needs. Um, so figure out what those are for you or your business and um, that's really where the tricky part of that application comes in. For the PPP loans, you can still access the application form that the Treasury put out. Individual lenders might have their own forms, but the information required will be the same. So we have a link to that on our FAQ. I encourage you to check that out and you know, fill it out ahead of time if you can. Have all of your documentation ready to go. If you're a business with employees, have all your payroll, um, tax filings, your financial statements ready to go to provide to a lender right away. If you're an independent contractor, get that 2019 Form 1040 Schedule C filled out. Have your 1099 MISCs ready to go. Because again, uh, you know, 310 billion used to be a lot of money, but we do think that it will only be a few days before lenders are once again coming close to running low on those funds. So again, here is our resource for um, SBA issues on NAR's page, um, nar.realtor forward slash coronavirus SBA. We have an FAQ that we're updating, it feels like a few times a day at this point. Um, you can find the graphic there and um, other resources as well as we're creating them. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, just once again, um, to go over some of these um, commercial issues, and I already touched on most of these, the 1031 deadline extension, we've got that through July 15th, opportunity funds deadline extended through July 15th. If anyone on here is a property manager as well, um, IRAM has um, resources specifically for property manager, a little bit of a 
uh, cross um, promotion there for all of our wonderful affiliate organizations. Um, in the CARES Act, we got a fix for the qualified improvement property deduction. Um, that can be um, um, immediately, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Can't remember the word I'm looking for. I'm so sorry. Um, that, but um, we got a fix for that, which I will provide information on better. Um, oh, um, the immediate, sorry, depreciation is what I was looking for. That was the word. Um, under the CARES Act, businesses can now immediately write up the costs associated with making internal improvements to certain real estate um, properties, including restaurants and retail stores, instead of having to depreciate them over the 39 year life of the building. That was something that was left over from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that we've been trying to get fixed for years, and it took a pandemic to do so. But, you know, we'll take our wins where we can get them. Um, the CARES Act also includes provisions allowing businesses to offset tax losses. Um, so you can carry back net operating losses from 2018, 2019, or 2020 against profitable years up to five years and get immediate refunds. Um, Finally, um, let's see, uh, the SBA loans that I went over, and um, let's talk about what's next. We are um, still awaiting further guidance from the SBA and the Department of Labor. For the SBA, we're sort of waiting to hear as soon as they get more funding appropriated, are these loan applications going to open back up right away? Are we going to have a little bit of lag time? Um, that's what we're waiting for there. And from the Department of Labor, again, that pandemic unemployment assistance information for the state. Uh, what are we looking for in phase four? That remote notary um, ability, um, increased funds for housing counseling, relief for landlords. We, um, one thing we've specifically been asking for is a business and employee recovery fund, which would be a federally backed fund um, to help a broad swath of businesses cover their expenses as well as keep employees on payroll. Um, and really anything else, you know, we're collecting information from our members to see where they need the help, where they are hurting the most, um, where we can find, you know, tax incentives or um, extend deadlines that will help them out. So again, for the final time, there is our our um, link at the bottom for general coronavirus issues, nar.realtor forward slash coronavirus FAQ, which I encourage you to check out. And now, questions. I'm sure I answered all your questions and nobody has any, so. Thanks, Erin. Uh, we actually do. We have a couple from um, our <laughs> listeners. The first one is, um, is there guidance on the PPP loan forgiveness as it relates to rent payments from an operating company paying rent to a separate company that has overlapping ownership? Um, ooh, that's specific. <laughs> well, uh, what I can tell you is rent payments are an eligible use of the PPP loan. Um, as long as other requirements are met, which again would be that 75% of the total loan amount goes toward maintaining payroll costs and the employee headcount remains the same. Um, uh, there's nothing in the CARES Act or any of the guidance that I've seen that would say that you wouldn't be able to take the remaining 25% and put that toward rent to another company and have and be eligible for the forgiveness. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, another one we have is what if a portion of my 7A PPP loan is not eligible for forgiveness? Under what timelines does the loan have to be repaid? So um, you do not have to make any payments for the first six months. Um, the interest rate on those is fixed at 1%. And it is a two year repayment. Um, uh, you have two years to repay the loan. Those are the repayment terms for PPP, which um, um, that's, uh, that may be changed by the SBA. They've made a few tweaks to what they originally had, but I think they've settled upon that. Two years, 
1% interest and you don't have to make any payments for the first six months. That's great. Thank you again. Um, we have quite a few questions, so we're just going to keep on going. Um, does the CARES Act include rent or loss, uh, rent loss or business interruption coverage? Um, there is not anything for business interruption coverage. Um, nothing uh, specific for rent loss. Um, there is the mortgage forbearance for multifamily properties that are touched in some way by the federal government, which I mentioned, um, that also comes along with, um, having to provide, um, an eviction moratorium for tenants in properties. If you get that mortgage forbearance, um, really, uh, that would, you know, it, it, this is one of the things that we're pushing for in phase four, and we've also been working for um, with the agencies because it is really tricky. Um, uh, you could argue that with the Paycheck Protection Program loans and the Economic Injury Disaster loans, um, businesses that are tenants would potentially, uh, you know, be able to take some of those funds and pay rent with them to their landlord. Um, obviously, with the increased pandemic unemployment assistance. The hope is that people will be able to make their rent payments and, and buy the necessities with that increased funding if they are unemployed. There is nothing specific to that point. Thank you. Um, and then our next one is, what do you think of this question around uh, SBA 7A? What if you operate as an LLC or other pass-through entity without any employees? So this is something that we are digging more into. Um, LLCs should be eligible to apply for these. I have heard from some people that they are told that as a, an S-Corp, uh, they were not eligible. Again, you don't have to have employees to apply for these. Um, that was the whole point of allowing sole proprietors, self-employed and independent contractors to be able to access them. Um, but you do have to have some kind of um, payroll costs or net earnings for the year before. So this is something we're looking into, but um, basically you should consult with your uh, accountant or financial advisor. And um, when you're talking with a, an SBA lender, um, they should also be able to provide you guidance on that point. Um, this is something that, again, um, we're talking to the Hill about because I think it's something that, honestly, um, members of Congress just didn't, th this came together so quickly that there were a lot of small details um, that they didn't have time to contemplate, frankly. And um, so we're sort of finding little gaps in the program um, holes and gray area that we need more specific information or clarification that yes, this person is eligible for this. Um, and that's one of them. That's great. So it, it's kind of a, a follow-up question around there and it addresses another question that came through. Um, based on, you were saying about previous years. So if you haven't submitted your 2019 taxes, will that have any effect they'll go off your 2018 uh, what what's no. how does that so, work you are not negatively impacted if you haven't filed your 2019 taxes yet obviously they extended those deadlines but they will not look at your 2018 forms you have to fill out your 2019 form 1040 schedule c to qualify for this program or excuse me the ppp loan program as an independent contractor you don't have to file it, but you do have to fill it out. Um, and it cannot be the 2018. That's really helpful. And also kind of uh, another follow-up there is even if your revenue is stable or increasing and you have no threat of furlough or employment termination, the 7A PPP loan applies under these current guidelines. So there's no need uh, criteria associated with the program? Yes and no. So they are not asking people to provide proof of economic hardship here. Having said that, you know, with, with the high demand and the businesses that legitimately need it, um, 
we would hope that if someone doesn't need the loans, they would not <laughs> apply for it. Um, um, basically, though, the government is assuming that if you were a business in operation on February 15th of this year, you have felt some sort of negative economic impact as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So you do have to make a good faith statement um, that you have been negatively impacted by it. You do not have to provide any proof. Um, and I should also mention, you know, you don't have to be completely out of business. You don't have to be completely shut down, not bringing in any money. Um, we've had some of our members who have asked, well, you know, I had deals that were closing, you know, that I started in December or November of last year and they're, you know, the closings just went through, so I'm just getting paid for them. So I haven't seen any negative impact yet, but I also haven't started any new deals since the beginning of March because of all of this, or, you know, there's no new clients. That certainly counts. Um, you don't have to have it show on your bottom line immediately that you've been negatively impacted. You can look at the business that you've brought in, what's going on with the deals that you already had in the works and determine, oh, well, that's not going to finish when it was supposed to. Or typically, you know, I'd be working on two or three deals right now and I'm only working on one as a result of this. So um, it's up to everyone to sort of look at their own situations and determine whether or not they have been impacted or will be impacted. We, again, we certainly would hope that nobody would apply for these loans that doesn't actually need it because there are so many businesses that are in need right now. and. Um, as I mentioned, that funding is only gonna go so far. Um, we'll have probably looked at almost a trillion dollars in funding for these small business programs alone by the time this is over, if not more. And that may not be enough for many of those businesses. So it's a bit of an honor system thing, but um, you know, the, the assumption is if you are open on February 15th, you have been negatively impacted. Good information. Just a kind of an interesting ripped from the headlines note that it might be uh, it just occurred to me and I'm, I'm wondering if others are, are thinking the same thing with Shake Shack just coming out in the news that they are returning part of their uh, their loan, that $10 million. Um, does that go back in the pool for other business businesses to be able to use now or what, what happens to that, that fund? Yes, so that's what we understand, um, that it will go back into the um, general SBA pool for those PPP loans. Um, you know, Shake Shack returning that, um, it's, it's great. I think there may be a few other um, similarly situated um, businesses that will maybe choose to do the same because of PR reasons. Um, um, but, you know, $10 million, that's that's the maximum amount of these loans. So that may only provide a loan for one other business at this time. Um, it could provide many loans for um, individual independent contractors, but um, it all depends on, you know, where people are in the line, basically. Good. Um, and then um, we have a question um, around an uh, operating LLC S Corp without employees. How do you qualify? Um, Casey, our uh, chief economist, touched on mortgage servicing and the challenges they face with bond payment obligations versus forbearance that could trigger a default. Uh, what is being done to resolve that conundrum? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> 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 and I hate to give that answer, um, but I actually don't typically handle those that side of these issues. Um, I will ask my esteemed, wonderful, brilliant colleague, Megan Booth, that question and um, provide you with uh, what she tells me. Um, I can tell you in general, when it comes to these relief options, we are looking at everything um, and anything, frankly. Um, and so um, I am sure that is something that is being considered and worked on, um, just not currently by me, <laughs> the advocacy team here. That's fair. Yes, I know you have a, a wonderful team at uh, NAR that is being so, uh, you, obviously everyone has to focus on their areas. You can't be, uh, it's such a broad topic. Um, 
One other one that came through, can you use the PPP loan to pay back rent if the lease was in place at on February 15th? Um, I guess it depends on what back, by what you mean by back rent, um, but the loans can be used for expenses incurred between February 15th and June 30th. You have an eight week period from when you get them to use them, but if you have rent that's due from before getting those loans, as long as it's between February 15th and June 30th of this year that it's owed, you can pay that, yeah. Gotcha. And then let's see, we have another one. Um, can I use 100% of the PPP loan, not 75% and receive 100% loan forgiveness? Not exactly sure if that needs more context for you. Um, well, there's really only two different situations that, that would be for. One, if you're a small business with employees, Yes, you can absolutely use 100% of that loan toward maintaining payroll costs and receive forgiveness. Um, the requirement for small businesses with employees is at least 75% of the loan go toward payroll costs. And with the remaining 25%, you can put it toward, among the other uses, payroll costs. So you can absolutely put 100% of the loan toward maintaining payroll costs if you have employees. If you have an independent, if, excuse me, if you are an independent contractor, then um, basically the program is now assuming that you are just going to use 100% to pay yourself, which is why they have the independent contractor amount based on eight weeks of the net earnings from 2019, as opposed to two and a half times the average monthly payroll cost for a business with employees. So um, yes, you can absolutely put 100% of the payroll protection program loan toward payroll costs or toward maintaining your own income. That's great. This has been wonderful. I'm going to ask one last question, and then I'm going to pass this off back to uh, Liz uh, with uh, CCIM Institute's pu Public Policy to wrap everything up. So our last question, um, and if we weren't able to get to yours, I really apologize, uh, but it was wonderful to be able to ask all of these. Should I exclude health insurance premiums and IRA contributions from payroll calculations? I, I know that you do not exclude health insurance premiums. You can include those. I am not sure about the IRA contributions. Um, I believe that you do include those as well, um, but I am not 100% certain on that. So um, I will actually look that up really quickly if you want to turn it over to Liz. <laughs> <laughs> the answer. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, and Liz, if you're, if you're on, we'd love for you to come back and, and uh, wrap up this wonderful session while Aaron is looking up that final answer. Absolutely. Larry and Aaron, both, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all for joining us for this legislative presentation today. I know there's so many questions out there and Aaron, we really appreciate you presenting this fantastic content and answering so many of our questions. A recording of this presentation will be available on CCIM Institute's YouTube channel at ccim.com slash COVID-19 later today. Um, and just thank you again. And before we tune off, I'll just see, um, I'll check in with Aaron. I know she was uh, checking on something on a question. Yeah. Um, it looks like, yes, um, you should be able to include retirement contributions um, as shown on Form 1040 Schedule C, Line 19. So, um, yes, <laughs> Aaron, <laughs> that's where that IRA is, then yes. Erin, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you for such a prompt response. Um, again, thank you all and uh, be well. Thank you.